Good evening. This is a very special occasion. It is Yud Dalid Kislev, the 14th day of the Hebrew month of Kislev, and that is the wedding anniversary of the Rebbe and the Rebetzin, the Lubavitcher Rebbe and uh, Rebetzin in the year Tafresh Petes, that was uh, 1928, last uh, months or even days of 1928, the winter of 28. Um, and there's a famous Hasidic discourse, a mimer, that was recited at the wedding festivities by the Rebbe's father-in-law, the previous Rebbe. He recited this mimer at the Kabbalah's Ponim, and it became customary that many chsanim, many grooms, at their own wedding will recite this same mimer at their Kabbalah's Ponim. That's the, the ceremony that takes place before the chuppah. Um, furthermore, in the year Tovshin Yud Dalid, so we're talking about uh, 1954, the Rebbe, as the Rebbe often did, said a discourse of his own, which was an elaboration upon the discourse that his father-in-law delivered. Uh, interestingly, the previous Rebbe delivered the original discourse at the Rebbe's, at the Rebbe and the Rebbetzin's wedding. And when the Rebbe said his own version <clears throat> of this discourse, the date was Yud Gimel Elul, which is the wedding anniversary of the previous Rebbe. So one good turn deserves another, so to speak. Um, and it has become customary. Actually, I was just thinking that when I got married back in Tovshin Samach, it was still sort of like a discussion people were talking about. Well, do you say the previous Rebbe is L'chad Daidi, or do you say the Rebbe is L'chad Daidi? Uh, and then some people were even saying both, and I wasn't ready to do both, but I, I, I just did the Rebbe is L'chad Daidi. Because within the Rebbe is L'chad Daidi, you have also the previous Rebbe is L'chad Daidi, because the style of the discourse is that it's a, an explanation of and an elaboration upon uh, the, the, the previous Rebbe is L'chad Daidi. I keep saying L'chadedi. What is L'chadedi? It's Hebrew words. <laughs> uh, come, my beloved. What's it referring to? It's a Friday night prayer that we say. It's the famous uh, hymn. How you like that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying way too hard to speak English right now. Who says hymn? Nobody says hymn. H-Y-M-N. Hymn. Anyways, it's that famous Friday night song uh, composed by... Uh, Shleim Alkabetz, the uh, the Kabbalist. He was one of the the Kabbalists from Tzfas. He was actually originally from Salonika, from uh, Thessaloniki, but he uh, he lived in Tzfas in the times of the Arizal, along with many other Kabbalists. And he wrote poetry. And one of his great poems was the Luchad Dedi poem, "Come, my beloved, let's greet the bride." And um, these are the opening words of the discourse. L'chadedi l'kras kala p'nei Shabbos n'kabla. Come, my beloved, let's greet the bride. We will receive the Shabbos. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is talk about some of the major themes of this mimer. But specifically... I've been asked by my partners in this event. This is a special partnership with mikvah.org. And I was requested to specifically speak about how they, the mimer is applied to brides and brides-to-be. And I guess brides that were, meaning <laughs> wives who have already been married and... Uh, we can always continue learning. We can uh, always go back to the basics. And, uh, and, and, and I liked that idea. First of all, I liked that idea because my oldest child, my daughter, Tybal, is a Kala right now. So I figure <laughs> if I can't help her pick out the centerpieces and the floral uh, arrangements, at least I can maybe record 
a discourse that will help her to prepare. Um, but I, I liked the idea of presenting this mimer specifically with an emphasis on how it applies to, to women because personally I've been involved in teaching this discourse before to men, either to Bachram, to young single men who are getting ready to be in a marriage mindset, or to guys who had just been married, or even to men who had been married for a while. But um, I, I never specifically presented it to women, and, and, it, and it occurred to me that women are, are an important part of marriage. How you like that for the truism of the night? Yeah, so men learn this mimer, and they don't just recite it. I'm saying in Chabad, the, the, culturally, the custom is they, they don't just recite it at the Kabbalah's Ponim. It's, um, that's the guidebook. That's the manual for the spiritual preparations for marriage. So, so the men are learning this as their preparation for marriage. Um, wouldn't it be a good thing for the women to be on the same page? Literally, the same page of the same discourse. So that's what we're going to do. Um, I think anyone could benefit. I hope anyone can benefit from what we're going to talk about tonight. But if it's okay, I'm going to make a special emphasis on how women can internalize and apply these ideas. So that, that's, that's the plan tonight with, with Hashem's help. Okay. So... I'm just going to go through a little bit the structure of the mimer very briefly, um, and then we'll unpack it slowly, okay? So just very briefly, there are uh, seven chapters in this mimer. It's not a very long mimer. It's not very short. It's not very long, sort of medium. There are seven chapters. The first chapter, the Rebbe mentions that this is uh, an elaboration upon the mimer that his father-in-law delivered. And as I mentioned, that the Rebbe's father-in-law delivered at the Rebbe's own wedding ceremony. And the, the, the major idea is that you have bride and groom, which correspond to the Jews and Hashem. And in Kabbalistic terms, Malchus and Zoh. We'll unpack this slowly, so I'm not going to go into defining each of these terms uh, very carefully right now. I just want to go quickly through the structure of the mimer, okay? And that these different relationships, um, they're all iterations of the same dynamic, just on different levels. Um, they unite with each other through a process of first connecting in a superficial way and then uniting in a deep way. That's the first chapter. In chapter two, the Rebbe mentions that in the previous Rebbe's Mimer, there were two examples given to uh, illustrate the concept of the giver-recipient dynamic. The first example was a teacher and a student. And as we mentioned, in order for the, these, these two uh, entities to merge, there's a process where first they, they find common ground on some superficial level, and then th from there they move into a, a, a deeper connection. So the first example is teacher-student, and the way that the teacher-student find a more superficial um, common language is first through telling I mean, I, I, I don't like to translate it as a joke. Often it's translated as a joke. It doesn't have to be funny, though. And if anyone has heard my jokes, you probably know I'm kind of biased in believing that jokes don't have to be funny. It's not the point of a joke. What am I, a comedian? <laughs> what, stand here and tell jokes to you? Milsa <laughs> is uh, just a way of opening up a rapport. And then from there, the teacher can say some deep stuff. And then actually what ends up happening is the teacher ends up receiving more than what he originally delivered. Because as we say, I've learned 
much from my teachers, even more from my colleagues, but from my students, I've learned most of all. The teacher receives more from his students, even than what he gave. In chapter three, the Rebbe mentions the second example in the previous Rebbe's Mimer of a giver-receiver relationship, and also how it begins with a shallow or superficial uh, connection, but then it goes deeper, and the same dynamic repeats itself, where through the deeper connection, the giver ends up getting more than what he started with. And, and, that, and that example is a father who bends down, who stoops down to pick up his small child so he can lift them up so that they can be face-to-face, -face, and then they can play together. So the stooping down is just a practical thing. It's a superficial thing. If the child were already on the father's level, he wouldn't even have to stoop down. But that's what enables the child to come up to the father's level. And then once that superficial act is, is complete, then they can play together. And that's the, the, the deeper connection. That's the deeper bond. And then, of, of course, there has to be something gained from that that's even greater than what the giver, in this case the father, came into the interaction with. And the Rebbe there mentions that the original source for this uh, parable is from the Magid, the Mizritcha Magid. And in the Mizritcha Magid's description, he mentions that the father's uh, beard, the father has a beard, and that uh, the child plays with the father's beard. We know Kabbalistically the beard represents Yud Gimel Tukune Dikna. That's the 13 strands of the supernal beard, which represent the 13 uh, attributes of mercy, which is an incredibly high level in the chain-like progression of world building. And the Rebbe makes a point of saying, and yet, whatever ha that's only the superficial uh, connection. Whatever happens in the internal connection, the real bonding, is even higher than Yud Gimel Tukune Dikna. Again, stressing this, this pattern, this pattern that giver, recipient come, they find common ground on a superficial level, they bond on a deeper level, and then the giver ends up receiving more than what he came into the relationship with. Okay. Chapter 4 of the Mimer explains, and this, this is very interesting, giver and recipient in terms of prayer and the rest of your day. When we pray, this is counterintuitive, but remember we spoke about the process. The process is first something superficial and then something deeper. <laughs> When we relate to Hashem through prayer, that's called a superficial relationship. That's a warm-up act. When we discover Hashem in our, in our day, in our regular pedestrian mundane activities, ah, that's an intimate connection. It's counterintuitive because normally you'd think of prayer as the end-all and be-all. That's the ultimate goal. And, and no, no, no. Prayer, and that's why we pray in the morning and why it's so important to pray before you check your phone, before you answer your emails, before you do any of the mundane stuff, because prayer sets the tone. But it's first also because it's, it's, the, it's the preparation. It's the priming the pump, so to speak. And after you do that, then you can get into the intimate connection with Hashem, which is spending the rest of your day with Hashem, doing all types of seemingly mundane things, but discovering the spiritual experience in it. Okay, that was chapter four. Chapter five goes more into depth explaining how the relationship between the giver and recipient ends up benefiting both of them. Um, obviously, it benefits the recipient because the recipient is receiving. That's an obvious benefit. But a little bit less obvious is what we mentioned earlier. The giver is also ending up receiving. He ends up getting more than what he came in with. And, and the Rebbe explains here in chapter, in chapter 5, the reason why this happens, the reason why it's not a zero-sum game, the reason that it actually ends up having a, a, uh, a net gain is because the recipient which in Kabbalistic terms is called Malchus, comes from a higher source than the giver who is called Zah. And it is her higher source that's being revealed when that 
net gain from their interaction emerges. And that's the idea of Aishas Chayla Teres Baila, that a woman of valor is the crown of her husband, that really she comes from a higher source, and that's what she's revealing when they, they bond, and there's that uh, added um, dimension that wasn't there before. Where did that come from? Well, it's really the revelation of the higher source of the recipient who actually turns around and becomes a giver. Um, in chapter six, the Rebbe explains Shabbos as a paradigm of this recipient, that from one end you can see Shabbos as a totally passive day. You can't do any work. Everything that Shabbos has is only what was prepared on the, on the six work days. Uh, so in that sense, she's totally a recipient. On the other hand, all blessing comes from Shabbos. So the ensuing work week gets all of its blessing from the Shabbos that preceded it. So that's that that uh, sort of paradoxical uh, identity of Shabbos or femininity or Mechabal or Malchus. They're all the same concept. Um, they receive, but in receiving, they end up revealing more than what they were given. And then in chapter 7, the Rebbe says that uh, ultimately the greatest expression of this is the physical expression. And uh, the physical expression, at least allegorically, can be described by Shlema Melech's sage words, Hakol min ha'afer, everything comes from the dirt. Everything comes from the soil, right? Everything lives on this planet all life exists because of energy that we consume from the soil. You can't, at least, unless you're a plant and can photosynthesize, you can't eat the sun. But the sun grows the crops, and then we eat the crops, or the animals eat the crops, and we eat the animals, or however the food chain works. But everything comes from, all life comes from the soil. You put the seed in the soil, and life emerges. And uh, that's literal, but it's also figurative, because it's a parable for human procreation, and that the ultimate revelation of how the recipient becomes the ultimate giver is in literal biological pregnancy, gestation, and childbirth, where a woman creates new life and a new generation. So that is, and that's chapter six, that is, I mean, I'm sorry, chapter seven, that's chapter seven, the final chapter, and that's, that's the, the, the structure of the mimer. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these ideas in both in a conceptual sense, but also a, 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 a practical sense. And, and I want to do both. In other words, I want to explain a little bit more what these ideas mean as ideas, but at the same time, I want to talk about what it looks like in in everyday life. So I think the first thing that's important to understand is how these um, paradigms are sort of like fractals repeating themselves, you know, like an M.C. Escher painting where you have the same image sort of repeating itself in, in, in patterns. Or in nature you find fractals, you know, like the shape of the tree is the shape of the leaf. You ever notice that? Like a pine tree is the shape of a pine needle. An oak tree is the shape of an oak leaf. You ever hold it up? Yeah, you can. If you live in Canada, you can probably picture what a, a, a maple leaf looks like. And that's the shape of a maple tree. Yeah, those are fractals in nature. And um, these patterns are repeating patterns. So we have different bywords to describe one in the same relationship. It's the same relationship reiterated on, on different levels. Um, the general categories are mashpia and makabal, which we will translate for now as giver and recipient, but I'm, I'm going to revisit that definition uh, a little bit later this evening uh, because I don't think it's a helpful definition once you really understand what these ideas mean. So we have mashpia and makabal, which is giver and recipient, and um, they can be expressed in many different ways. So in, in terms of uh, 
spiritual energies in the world of Atsilas, the world of emanation, it's called Zah and Malchus. Giver and recipient is called Zah and Malchus. Zah are the six emotions, Chesed, Gvurit, Tiferes, Netzach, Yisoid, which are the building blocks of creation. Uh, and, and Malchus is the spiritual womb, so to speak, which receives those energies and turns them into worlds. Atsilas is not even a world because it's so transparent. It's so, uh, it's, 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 it's so uh, nullified to creator can hardly be reckoned a creation. But from the union of Zon, Malchus, and Atsilos, it gives birth to worlds that can be properly described as creation because they do have enough of a sense of, of selfhood. So that's, that's how the Mashbi and Makabal relationship is, is described in the world of Atsilos. Um, but in time, for instance, it's called the six workdays and Shabbos. It's the, but it's the same paradigm. Again, the six work days and Shabbos. The six work days give to Shabbos. She receives what they prepare for her. And then she ends up creating something from that that's greater than what she received. Um, and in, in people, the same paradigm repeats itself again. You have a, a, a husband and a wife. So... All of these ideas are interchangeable, and sometimes we flow rather uh, seamlessly from one level to another level. A lot of times this throws people for a loop when they're learning this because, like, hold on a second. Are we talking about men and women, or are we talking about Zon Malchus, or are we talking about the six workdays in Shabbos? And what's the answer? Yes. Well, no, which one? Yes, it's all of them because these are just different ways of describing the same thing. There's a letter in the Igris that the Rebbe responds to someone who asks, why are there not so many mashalim in Chassidus Chabad? Which is a, mashalim means allegories, parables, which is a funny question because there are so many allegories in uh, Chassidus Chabad. But what he means, you could tell this from the context of the Rebbe's letter, um, you don't see the person's letter, so you have to sort of imagine what they wrote, but you can kind of figure it out from, from the Rebbe's response. What he means is not little short little um, metaphors um, that we use all the time, like uh, the, 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 the world is nullified to Hashem's creative force, like the sunbeam is nullified within the sun. Okay, we have metaphors like that but what he meant is extended metaphors like a whole long story with characters and a plot there are other hasidic uh books teachings that have that style metaphor where it's like a like a fairy tale almost it's like a long story where a bunch of stuff happens and a conflict and resolution and then you find out this character represents this and this character represents that okay so that's what the person was really asking the Rebbe. Why don't we have so many stories like that? So it's very interesting what the Rebbe responds. The Rebbe says that a metaphor in general is used by communicators as a rhetorical device. Um, meaning to say it's an effective mode of explaining something unfamiliar by comparing it to something familiar. A metaphor builds a bridge between the unfamiliar and the familiar. So, in other words, if there's something that's unfamiliar to you and you don't have a reference, a reference point for it, it's not helpful for me to continue talking about it because you're just getting more lost. So what do I do if I'm a, an effective communicator? I'll think of something that you already know, something that's familiar to you that has some properties in common with the thing that I really want to talk about. And I'll use that familiar thing as a model to get you to then understand that thing that was heretofore unfamiliar. So the Rebbe says, normally when metaphors are used, that's how they're used. They're used as an effective mode of, of communicating uh, and building a bridge from, from the, uh, the unfamiliar to the familiar or the familiar to the unfamiliar. Um, the Rebbe says, but that's not what a mime, that's what, not what a mushal is in a mimer chsidis. That's not how Chabad, uh, the, the Rebbeim of Chabad, use, use my modem. The Rebbe says, in, in Chabad, 
we we have less mashalim because these mashalim are extremely precise in as much as they are not merely rhetorical devices for communicating an idea, but rather when a Rebbe of Chabad uses an allegory or a parable, he is not comparing one thing to another thing. He is describing one thing as it coexists simultaneously on multiple planes of reality. In other words, we're not saying that the nullification of the existence of the world to the absolute existence of Hashem is like the way a sunbeam is lost within the sun. We're actually saying much more than that, that the properties of a sun being a sunbeam being lost within its source in the sun is a lower level manifestation and derivative of a higher archetype, which is the manner of nullification of the created world to its source in the creator. So when we say, going back to our discussion at hand, that a husband and wife are like Zo and Malchus, we're not saying they're like, they bear a resemblance. We're saying they are. In Atzilos, it's called Zo and Malchus. Down here in the terrestrial realm with people, it's called a husband and wife. In time, it's called six workdays and Shabbos. But it's the same concept reiterating itself on multiple planes of reality. So I think that's, first of all, very important to understand. And we have to realize that this specific dynamic, this mashpia makabel dynamic, not only reiterates itself throughout every plane of reality, but in some ways it is the most uh, essential and definitive uh, paradigm within existence itself. Because ultimately, when we speak about giver, recipient, mashpia, makabel, we're speaking about creator, creation. So existence itself is the manifestation of a mashpia, makabel relationship. Furthermore, our Jewish identity is only understood within the context of a mashpia makabel relationship. Hashem is the mashpia. His people are the makabel, which is why, alternatively, we refer to Hashem as the groom and the Jews as the bride, because all of these terms are interchangeable. All of these terms are are really just different, uh, different words for describing the same phenomenon as it repeats itself in different contexts. So <laughs> when we understand the relationship between Hashem and his creation, we also understand the relationship between a husband and a wife. And when we understand the relationship between a husband and a wife, we understand the relationship between Hashem and His creation. It works both ways. It's called hafshata and halbasha. The two directions. They both work. There's, uh, you know, the constructing and deconstructing. Hafshata, to be mafshit, means to strip away the trappings, the lower level trappings of an idea, and to extract the pristine archetype from it. In other words, to lose the concrete reference point and to go to the, the abstraction. So that's called hafshata. In other words, mibsari achse aleka, like good old Job said. That, that phrase from the book of Eov is off, off, often used in Chassidus to describe the idea of, of hafshata, that mibsari achse aleka, from my flesh I perceive godliness. That sometimes Chassidus will explain, for instance, let's say, in koiches and nefesh, in the human experience, uh, the relationship between pleasure and will. 
just to give an example, Tynigen Rotzein. Um, and we use that. Oh, I relate to that. I know that because I'm a human. I relate to the human experience. But then we'll do some Hafshota and we'll say, yeah, but really forget about the trappings of how it's experienced in, in, on, on the human plane. That's really describing high levels within, say, the Rishtalshos. We're talking about divine pleasure and divine will. So that's called Hafshota. But then there's halbasha. Halbasha is the, the opposite direction, to be malbish, to invest the abstract idea within a concrete example. And again, like I said, those examples are not random examples. They're not literary examples. Those examples are, are, are not literary, they're literal. <laughs> and not literal the way everyone uses the word literal now. <laughs> he literally had fire shooting out of his eyes. I mean, he really did? No, I mean, literally. Well, literally means he really did. <laughs> when something exists on a spiritual plane, so like it says in chapter 3 of Tanya, that it comes down, everything as above, so below, it trickles down, and then it becomes manifest on a, on a, on a lower level as well. That's called halbasha. So we can go both directions here. Um, we can learn about our relationship with God in order to be better spouses, or we can become better spouses to learn how to serve God better. But it works in both directions, and actually it's a virtuous circle because one always leads back to the other. Keep, keep on going back and forth. Now, let's speak a little bit more in detail about this particular relationship. And I said I'm going to focus on the female perspective, the feminine perspective. So I mentioned earlier that Mashpia Makabal is often translated as giver and recipient, and, and I'm guilty of uh, using those same translations as well. I've done it right here in front of you <laughs> this evening. Uh, but I did say when I did it, I, I want to revisit it and have a chance to, to redefine those, those words. So I, I don't like giver and recipient, and, and I'll tell you why. Because to call femininity a recipient is misleading and demeaning. Unfortunately, it's a very common misunderstanding. It's ubiquitous and universal. Unfortunately, throughout the ages... Femininity, femininity has been perceived as being synonymous with passivity, weakness, uh, lack of agency, and um, that's an absolute mischaracterization, and it would be a terrible mistake if we were to think that that's what giver and recipient means and is reinforcing. Okay, so then... What's a better way of translating Mashpia Makabal? Well, let's visit the metaphors that we've been using, you know, like teacher student. So we said the teacher's the giver, the student's the recipient. Okay, that's pretty obvious to understand why they're being characterized as such. The teacher knows something the students don't know, which is why the teacher's the teacher. So the teacher has something that the students don't. Got it. There was a badchen at the famous uh, chasana that united the families of the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, and Rav Levi Yitzchak Berdichever. And this badchen, this comedian, speaking of Milsa Dibdichosa, he said, what's the difference between me and the Rebbe? Not so much. Think about it. Everything that I know, the Rebbe also knows. Everything the Rebbe doesn't know, 
I also don't know. The only difference between us is the stuff that the Rebbe knows that I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, obviously the teacher is the teacher because the Rebbe knows something that I don't know. And I want him to tell me. And yet, as we mentioned in the Mimer, Mitalmida Yesimakulam, the teacher ends up gaining more from the interaction than what he came in with. In this specific example, it's a clarity, it's a sharpening of the mind, it's insight that really only happens when you're teaching. And and I can vouch for this as somebody who's spent my 10,000 hours teaching that the greatest clarity that one can ever experience in trying to understand an idea is within the relationship of an engaged student uh, receiving uh, a, a lesson. There are simply insights that I believe are impossible to tap into otherwise. So who's the giver and who's the recipient? You hear what I'm saying? Or let's let's look at the example of Shabbos and the workdays, where the Rebbe explicitly unpacks that and speaks about that rather in depth, the two dimensions of Shabbos the two faces of Shabbos, so to speak, that on one hand, Shabbos is a passive day, that if you don't prepare food on Ed of Shabbos, you can no longer prepare it on Shabbos. So if it's candle lighting and all of a sudden you say, oh, you know what? I really should have gone to the grocery store and bought some potatoes and peeled them and grated them and baked them and made a kugel, well, coulda, shoulda, woulda, it's too late. It's now Shabbos, and Shabbos can't make potato kugel. Shabbos can't make anything. Shabbos is a day of absolute cessation of productivity. Well, shucks, look at that. Now we're completely out of luck. We're on this passive day, this weak, pathetic day that can't even make a kugel. Well, yeah, that's half a truth. You're not saying the rest of it, which is that the six work days give Shabbos a kugel, and she turns around, she turns it into something inc- incomparably greater. They give her a kugel, they give her a cholent, they give her whatever it is that you prepped and made, and you went out and you worked, and you made a, you made a paycheck, and you went grocery shopping, and okay, great. Those are all physical things, but you give those to Shabbos, she turns around and turns it into meaning, a reason to go on living for another six days. So six days going into Shabbos, give Shabbos some food and some cleaning and some, you know, getting a house physically prepared for for a day of rest. But then she takes that, flips it around, and gives to the six days that come out of her an absolute infinite upgrade, an incomparable upgrade, a reason to go out into the world again and to find meaning. So you're only telling half the story when you only speak of Shabbos as a recipient. Yes, it's true. She is a recipient, but she's a recipient that ends up giving back more than she received. And the same thing is true with the, with the physical examples that the Rebbe gives in the end of the Maimon. Hakel mina offer, the the idea of of the soil being an embodiment, a literal embodiment, a physical manifestation of malchus. You put the seed in the dirt, and you grow a tree, which grows fruits with potentially an infinite amount of seeds. Think about that in terms of ROI, return on investment, right? They say uh, anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in a seed because there are infinite potential apples in every seed. But in order to reveal those 
apples that are hidden in the seed. You have to put the seed in the soil, in the earth, which is malchus, which is femininity. So if you only take a snapshot of putting the seed in the ground, oh, giver and recipient, the seed is the giver, the, the earth is the recipient. Yeah, but you're only looking at one slice of a continuum. Look at how the process unfolds. When that seed unleashes that infinite potential for growth in the form of that tree with many fruits, which contain seeds, which grow many more trees with many more fruits, with many more seeds, and so on and so forth, ad, ad infinitum. Um, so who's the real giver? Who's the real giver? So that's why I want to revisit the whole giver-recipient translation of Mashbia Makabal. And in fact, in the Mimer, the Rebbe says it rather clearly uh, in, in chapter 5. The Rebbe says that the Makabal becomes a Mashbia, that Malchus is Mashbia to Zah. So you're defining Malchus as a recipient, but yet she ends up giving to her to her giver, which is Zah. And which we mentioned earlier is expressed by the idea of the, by the idea of Ashes Chayla Teres Baila. When the when the woman becomes a crown of her husband. So the crown means she's on top, she's superior. What's her superiority? That she ends up being a mashpia to the mashpia, the giver to the giver. So here's how I want to translate Mashpia Makabal. Having in mind that Mashpia Makabal are are bywords for masculinity and femininity. Masculinity is a giver, Mashpia, a giver. And femininity. A macabre is an even bigger giver. So my shpia macabre, we're not going to call it anymore giver and recipient. It's not accurate. It's not the whole story. Shpia macabre, masculinity and femininity, is a giver and an even bigger giver. Because what she gives to him is greater than what he gave to her. And of course, the ultimate example is childbirth. And that's also mentioned at the very end of the Mimer. That her ability to create something out of nothing, to reveal the kaya ha'insof, the power of, of infinity, by bringing new life, brand new life into the world, that is uniquely feminine. That's something that he cannot do. She can give that to him. He can't give that to her. So Mashpia Makabal is not giver and recipient. It's, it's giver and an even bigger giver. Okay. Now, if you're an intelligent uh, woman and you're listening to this, you're probably thinking to yourself, hmm, that's very flattering. It's empowering. I like that. I like hearing that femininity isn't just passive, but I'm now concerned. I'm concerned about now that you've given me greater clarity about my role as a woman being an even greater giver than my husband, um, what's his role? <laughs> In other words, everyone's a giver, but she's a greater giver. Okay, so then what do you need him for? And if you're an intelligent woman, you're going to ask this question uh, at least, at the very least, you're going to ask it practically, like, so then why do I, why do I have to get married? <laughs> what do I need a man in my life for? 
But uh, if you're if you're compassionate, then you might ask the question, the same question, but you'll ask it for different reasons. You could ask it on a deeper level, like, "Oh my goodness, what's his identity? Like, <laughs> I feel bad for him. What, <laughs> what 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 purpose does he serve? If at the end of, at the end of the day, I'm a bigger giver." So it's it's a it's a serious question, and and I want to explain something to you from a from a male perspective. Um, this male identity crisis is very real. the The question that a husband has as to his value, like what am I here for? Like what what do I do? You know, at the end of the day, what am I providing really? I, I you know, I can't bring life into the world. I, I, I don't, I'm not the one who's really raising these children the way that a the way that a mother can in a keres habayis. It's her home; she's the ma- the mainstay of the home. You know, I'm just a guest here. I, I'm I'm just working to pay the bills. And if she also works and brings in an income, <laughs> then my role is even less unique, right? Like, what what am I doing here? And and I and I, and I hope people listening don't think this is any sense. Of, uh, don't don't sense for me any any hyperbole or dramatization for the sake of uh, uh, being performative. Uh, this is a real issue, and some even would call it a crisis. And, you know, there's a whole men's rights movement that's, that's emerged from, from this real existential uh, crisis, uh, particularly in, in the modern age where the, the marriage contract in, in, in not just the ancient world, but just... Pre- previously to, to, to the very, very modern age, wh- it was more clear the necessity of, of a male because the world was an un- a much more unsafe uh, place and, uh, and also having to do with, with the oppression of women. So women needed male protection. So it was mu- the point is, in the past, it was much more clear what the function of a man is and, and how, he's necessity, how he's of necessity and what, what function and purpose he fills. And today, it is not a joke. And if you're a woman and you're marrying a man, it behooves you to understand this, that many men question, what value am I even bringing to this relationship? And rather than dismiss the question and say, oh, don't say such, don't, don't, don't say such things, don't doubt yourself, I, I want to lean into the question. I want to double down on the question. I actually want to use our understanding from Chassidus to, to make the question even stronger and to say, yeah, you're right, man. What is our purpose? Because Chassidus says, we're mashpiyim, we're givers, and she's a makabal, she's a recipient. Ah, but then you learn a little bit more and you find a makabal means an even greater giver. So I'm a giver, but she's a greater giver. So see, this is even is 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 intensifying the question. You understand me? So remember, I said earlier that it's very misleading when you look at a snapshot. Like I said, if you look at just the moment where the Meshpia is giving to the Makabal, you would think she's totally passive and has no role. But if you come back later and you see where she returns whatever she's received in an, in an upgraded fashion, in an incomparably upgraded fashion, um, then you realize, oh, Oh, there is something to her. Something quite indispensable. Um, I want to do the same thing now regarding masculinity. I just want to flip it. If you look at the end result, yes, it's true. She's the final giver. She's the bigger giver. She culminates the process. She finishes the job. She makes it real. She she brings it down to earth, both figuratively and literally. And in and in that sense, we are in awe of femininity. But here's what you have to remember about masculinity. He gives first. 
And that is what makes him indispensable. And that is what makes him unique. And that is his role. That cannot be denied. It cannot be taken away from him. He gives first. So we're not arguing that she's uh, not a bigger giver. She is a bigger giver. But she gives big by giving back. She doesn't initiate the process. She culminates it. She finishes it wonderfully, marvelously. But she finishes something. She doesn't start it. And that is so incredibly important to understand that a male role is to be an initiator. Maybe it'll make it more disarming, uh, less triggering, as it were, if I could discuss this paradigm in really lofty realms. In other words, before our highest iterations of this of this uh, relationship was Zah and Malchus. Those of you who are Kabbalistically inclined, if you don't mind, I'd like to go up a little bit higher and say they're Stauschless, uh, because there's another uh, masculine-feminine pair in Atsilos even higher than Zah and Malchus. And uh, for those of you who have learned a little bit of Chassidus or Kabbalah, uh, no doubt you are familiar with of the aim, ava, father and mother, being bywords for chachma and bina. Chachma is the initial flash of thought, baraka mavrik. Bina is elaborative thought, bina malashin boyne to build. The function of chachma is masculine. It literally deposits a kernel or germ of an idea within Bina. And the function of Bina is feminine. It is quite literally, quite literally a womb, uh, a conceptual womb within which a, uh, a very fleeting and uh, unarticulated concept is given dimension. Breadth, depth. And details begin to emerge. So Chochmah and Bina are masculine and feminine. And like I said, I, I'm, I want to talk about them, those because I think it's a little bit less threatening. Uh, we'll, get to, we'll get to the actual human manifestations of this but sometimes i think it's a bit it's a little bit uh easier to talk about it in uh in loftier terms that are a little bit less threatening <laughs> that don't they don't hit home so much sometimes that's an advantage so think about it like this chachma without bina is an absolutely useless idea it has no practical application there, there was a guy who he came to churchill during the world during world war ii uh and he said he has an idea what he's going to do the big problem that the the british had is that the german u-boats submarines they were sinking all of the ships that were sailing in the atlantic so they couldn't figure out how to find these U-boats and to stop them. So some guy got a meeting with Churchill during World War II, and he said, I have an idea how to get rid of the U-boats so that we can safely uh, navigate the Atlantic. So Churchill says, what is your idea? He says, well, it's quite simple. We heat up the Atlantic Ocean until it boils, and then all the U-boats will boil and they'll rise to the top, and then we'll torpedo them. So Churchill says, okay, how do you boil the Atlantic Ocean? The guy says, look, I gave you a concept. Develop it. 
<laughs> okay, that's Chochmah without Bina. So, without Bina, the idea is just so abstract. It's, it's, it may not have any bearing or any relevancy in real life. It's, it's just, it, it remains totally theoretical. And that's why Chochman needs Bina in order to be, to be made real. On the other hand, Bina has to have something to develop. You know, you have to give me a first draft in order to edit it. You give me a first draft, I'll clean it up. I'll make it nice and pretty. But you got to give me a draft. So, yeah, in the end, Bina is the one who's going to deliver this beautiful, polished final product that is nice looking and practical and it works in real life. Gorgeous. But she's got to have something to work with. She's got to have something. She's got to have raw materials. So giver and recipient here really is describing a chronology. It's describing stages or phases of a process. When, when you don't understand it in a, in a, linear, linear, a linear or temporal context, it becomes very, if you look at it in a static uh, with a, from a, like a static point of view, it doesn't make sense because you're seeing the Meshpia is a giver, but the Makabal is a greater giver. So like, what's his role? But then once, if you look at it as a process, if you look at it as a, as a film instead of as a photo, then you realize, hold on a second. Yeah, she does the final work, but he had to give her something to work with. He had to give her something. Okay, and it maybe his original idea wasn't even a great idea. You know, sometimes when you're brainstorming, which is chokhmah, chokhmah is brainstorming, just throw out ideas. Don't censor yourself. Don't filter. We'll write everything on the whiteboard, and later on we'll work it out. Okay, that's, that's chokhmah. That's chokhmahizing. Then binaizing is, let's stop and look at each one of these and, th and figure out what it would take to actually do it and how practical it is and what it would look like, how much it would cost. So that's Chochmah and Bina. Okay. If you can grasp that, and remember I told you earlier that we're not talking about multiple ideas. We're talking about one idea. We just keep on describing it and we flow back and forth between different levels. So we describe it on different levels. This is one idea. We're, we're only speaking about one idea here, the Meshpia Makabal dynamic. So I just described how it works in Chochmah and Bina. Um, let's, now let's try to bring it down a little bit closer to home. In fact, literally to a Jewish home. There's a discussion among our sages regarding who's a bigger, uh, Baltz Daka or Balist's Daka as it were. Who, who's, who is more instrumental in giving charity in the Jewish home? And of course, in this uh, discussion, we are assigning and assuming traditional gender roles. That is assumed in this discussion. So, and you'll understand what I mean momentarily. Uh, the sages say, um, the poor man comes to the door. The pauper comes to the door and he asks for food. I know today everything is currency. It's not even currency. It's all electronic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, once upon a time, people asked for actual food. Um, so the poor man comes to the door and he asks for food. Now, the husband, again, traditional gender roles, is the breadwinner. He went out and he earned money and he went to the shuk, to the marketplace, and he bought flour and he brought home flour. But say our sages... The poor man cannot eat flour. Can't eat flour. You'll die of malnutrition. It's very interesting. You take the same flour, you mix it with water, and you bake it into bread, and it's the staff of life. But if you eat flour, God forbid, you can't absorb the nutrients. 
So the poor man can't eat flour. And I'll just add how much more so he can't eat the money that was used to buy the flour. But he can't even eat the flour. The woman takes that flour. She needs it. She bakes it. She turns it into bread. The poor man eats the bread and he lives thereby. So who who is the bigger giver of charity? And it's, it's, it's a deep question. It's not a silly question. Because the metaphor is, is revealing very important ideas about masculinity and femininity. And again, you can decide to reject the traditional gender roles as, as a social construct. That's fine, and I'm not going to debate that. What I will say is that as a, as a metaphor, even if you reject the, 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 the literal uh, application of it, as a metaphor, it's speaking about masculinity and femininity as concepts, as concepts, as what they represent spiritually. So the husband brings home the flour, but the poor man can't eat flour. The woman turns the flour into bread. The poor man eats the bread and thereby lives. Do you understand what this is describing? It's not just talking about flour. It's not just talking about traditional gender roles, which you can argue are a social construct, and I don't know how to win that argument. It's talking about existential truths that are undeniable. And that is that masculinity, and I'm stressing the word masculinity because I want to say something. Pause. We know that human characteristics exist along a spectrum. So I don't say a man and a woman. I say masculinity and femininity because we all know that it's not black and white. There are masculine aspects of women and there are feminine aspects of men. And they exist, they exist to varying degrees. No two people have the same degree of masculinity and femininity to the extent that you have some men who are more feminine than many women. And you have some women who are more masculine than, than many men. Hopefully those two don't marry each other. And I'm not saying that to be humorous at all. But what I'm saying is masculinity and femininity, not a man, a woman. Obviously, you're speaking about any given man and any given women, a woman, the, the, then it's, it's very hard to speak in such rigid black and white terms because people are human nature is, is, is nuanced. Okay. But if we're speaking in terms of the concepts, of the categories, the ideas, archetypes, so masculinity brings home flour, but no one can eat flour. Femininity turns flour into bread, which people can eat, but she can't bake bread without the flour that masculinity gives to her. Does that make it very clear? We're speaking in metaphor. We're talking about emotional energy. We're describing the currency of the relationship. What a woman gives to a man is greater than what a man gives to a woman. No argument. But without what he gives to her, she cannot give back to him in upgraded fashion a thing. So picture, if you will, a husband. And I don't say the following to cause shalom bias problems. To the contrary, God forbid, I'm not trying to cause problems. I'm trying to... Uh, hopefully preempt problems or if the problems already exist, at least to give perhaps uh, a vision for how to get out of it. Imagine a man comes home. He works, he comes home. And even if his wife works, which unfortunately today is very common. And yes, I did say unfortunately, and I meant it. I do think it is 
a blight that two income families have become normalized. But that's a discussion perhaps for another time. We'll see. Maybe we can elaborate on it further tonight. Um, a man comes home from work. And even if his wife also works, and she also came home. Um, and he is feeling downtrodden. He goes out into that dog-eat-dog -dog world, and he gets absolutely uh, torn to shreds. And he feels completely depleted. And he walks through the door, and all he wants is to be the king of his castle. All he wants, you know, what's my vision of being a married man as I'm going to come home and, and let my wife nurture me, let her comfort me. A little feminine warmth, a little sweetness after being out in that harsh world. Why not? What's, what could be so wrong with that? And uh, in many ways, this is, this is a paradigm that men, all men, bring with them into, a, into marriage based on their pre-existing experience with, with intimate relationships with, with women and or to be more accurate with a woman uh speak you speak i'm speaking of course of um one's mother and uh, you know you 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 can be freudian about it if if you wish but uh even even the bible speaks about the idea that marriage is an act of a man abandoning his uh family of origin his his home of his his parents and and cleaving to his wife to become one flesh, so it does use that term of abandonment. Early in the in the Bible in Genesis and Parshas Bereshis, so uh, a man has certain expectations of what femininity, uh, what role femininity plays in his life, and it's based on being a child. Well, a child obviously is completely uh, receptive. A child is not able to take care of himself or herself. So that's what parents do. Parents tend to children. They take care of children. Um, and so this man comes home. He walks through the door, and he immediately goes to his wife for solace, for comfort. And the whole thing blows up. And he can't figure out why. And he resents her. And she can't figure out why. And she resents him. What happened? What in the world happened? <sighs> he tried to get Shabbos to bake kugel. That's what happened. It is a violation of Shabbos to have Shabbos be the day that bakes kugel. Kugel can be, the material can be procured and prepared and made Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all the way up until sundown. But once the holy day of rest is ushered in, you can't make kugel. Shabbos doesn't make kugel. It is Hillel Shabbos. It is a desecration of the Sabbath. To ask femininity to be the initial giver. That is not how she works. She is a recipient not because she's a passive loser. No, her power is magnificent. But the way her power works is by upgrading raw materials. So when she's given raw materials, she can upgrade them. Incomparably so. She can take what she was given and turn it into something that's not only 10 times as good or a million times as good, but infinitely better so that, that it cannot even be quantified. Like we were saying before, you give Shabbos a kugel, she turns it into meaning. How many kugels does it take? What's the ratio, the critical mass where kugel equals meaning? 
on its own, never. It won't happen. It takes the feminine energy of Shabbos to create that transformation. Only she can create that infinite upgrade. So whether you're speaking about biology, where she takes that tiny packet of genetic information and she turns it into your child with, 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 a, with, with limbs and ten fingers and ten toes and a smile and a face and a personality and a, and a soul and a name. That's called an infinite upgrade. Or, or on a more pedestrian level, you, as a husband, come home and insert emotional energy into femininity. She takes it, develops it, expands and elaborates upon it, and returns it in an upgraded fashion. So here's what we're saying. We're saying that femininity needs to have something to work with. She needs to be given raw materials to work with. And if she provides her own raw materials, if she steps in to be the initiator, the initial giver, it is a desecration of her own femininity, of her own Sabbath-like role. And it is an inversion of Seder Ishtalshlis. It turns the entire flow of creative energy in the universe on its head and then everyone ends up feeling frustrated and out of their element and they don't know why. Now, I mentioned before that men have femininity and women have masculinity. And there are many contexts within which a man can express his femininity. The main form within which a man should express his femininity is in his relationship with God, because we collectively, the Jewish people, are God's wife. And there are many feminizing rituals that we have to remind ourselves of that role. But I'm trying to focus right now on the application to women, so I won't elaborate upon that. Um, women have contexts with, within which they can express their masculinity, and that's fine. And depending on the degree to which any given woman has masculine qualities, which is perfectly fine, uh, she will find healthy outlets for that. What I'm saying is in marriage between a man and a woman, it is incredibly important that at least in that context, the man plays the masculine role, the woman plays the feminine role. And when I say masculine and feminine, I don't mean blue or pink or fire trucks or ballet slippers. That's not what I'm talking about. Not talking about, do you want to watch the football game or do you want to go to the opera? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something much more elemental. I'm saying that in an emotional interaction between a bonded feminine masculine pair, otherwise known as a marriage. Things will be healthy and things will be right when femininity can work with what masculinity provides. And without getting into a message for the men, because I'm trying to focus on the women, men will be much more satisfied when they allow their wives to give back to them than when they try to take from their wives. A man who tries to take from his wife will always be frustrated because he's not supposed to be a taker. He's supposed to be a giver. But when he gives and waits and gets back what he gave in upgraded fashion, he will be deeply satisfied. And so, so will she be. They'll both be satisfied. So let's talk about the feminine role here. What is a woman to do? This really puts you at the mercy of this guy because he's got to make the first move. What are you supposed to do? You understand the dilemma. If I've adequately explained or made my case, you understand then the feminine dilemma. 
She has this incredible power, but it can only be unleashed if he initiates. So what do you do that seemingly places the woman into a very difficult position? She's waiting for him to make a move. And, and what if he doesn't? What if he's passive? Or worse yet, like we described earlier, instead of not, not only he doesn't take the masculine step of being the first giver, worse, worse still, he comes in and he tries to take from you. He tries to be a macabre to you. He tries to be feminine and take from you, which will never work. Just like he can't be pregnant and carry a child, he can't become a recipient of your emotional energy that is initiating from you. He can only re re receive in return emotional energy that he deposited within you and that you developed through emotional gestation and gave birth to and returned to him. So what are you supposed to do, woman? This is a problem. You appreciate the, the dilemma. So remember we spoke about the fact that a woman is able to give back greater quality, incomparably greater quality than, than whatever she received because she comes from a higher source, that Malchus comes from a higher source than Zah. Let's talk about that a little bit more because this is important here. What, what is this higher source that Malchus comes from that's higher than Zah? So we said Zah are the six emotional energies, the building blocks. Chesed, Gvurit, Tferes, Netzach, Yisaid. That's why there are six days of creation. Six days of creation are lower level manif manifestations of those six uh, emotional energies. We said that Malchus is the recipient she takes those energies, she becomes impregnated with them, she gives birth to worlds. But uh, Malchus, although she is the last of the ten spheroids, last of the ten uh, godly emanations, there is a principle of not trilosan besayfen besayfen betrilosan. It says in Sefer Yitzirah, the book of formation based on the teachings of Abraham, our patriarch, one of the uh, most ancient Kabbalistic t t texts. In other words, when you finally go to the end of the line, you come full circle back to the top. Which is why just parenthetically, the ultimate experience of a soul is not to climb to increasingly higher levels of paradise, but the ultimate experience of the soul is embodiment, or even more accurately, re-embodiment in the resurrection when the physical world will become perfected and holier than heaven in the era of Mashiach. Because ultimately, when you go so high, you come back low. And when you come low, you come back high. The whole thing is a circle. So Malchus is the end of the process, but it's a circle. She's the beginning of the process as well. So she's the 10th Sphira, but she's also rooted in the top sphere, and by top I mean um, not number one, but above number one, off the charts. These amps go to 11. We spoke about earlier Chachma and Bina, so Chachma is the first sphere. You have Chachma, Bina, Das, that's one, two, three, and then Za is Chesed, which is number four, and Gvura, which is number five, and Tiferes, which is number six. Netzach is seven, and Hoid is, is eight, and Yisoyed is nine. So that was six. And then you have Malchus, which is ten. But Malchus is also Keser Malchus. Malchus means kingship. Keser Malchus means the crown of kingship. So she actually, if you go all the way back up, 
to the origins. Above Chachma is a crown, Kesser, and that's what it means, Ashes Chayel, a Teres Baila. A Teres means the crown. It doesn't just mean uh, that she's higher, but a Teres Baila means a crown in the sense of Kesser, Kesser being the proto sphera, so to speak, which is so lofty that it cannot be categorized among the ten spheroes. There are different configurations. Obviously, there's those who are versed in uh, Kabbalah will, will mention that in the Ramax model, Kesser is one of the spheroes. But in Kabbalah Soari, which Chabad is based on, we, uh, we count Das as the third sphere, and number one is Chachma, and Kesser is off the charts. Like I said, these amps go to 11. So Kesser is off the charts. Uh, hence its name, Kesser, the crown. The crown is on top of the head. It's not part of the body. It's on top of the top of the body. So what is Kesser? Yeah, I know, it means crown. But remember I said earlier, Mibsari Echse Elaka, that by examining the various phenomena of the human psyche, which are created in God's image, we can understand the archetypes on high. So we've spoken about Chachman and Bina. Chachma is the original kernel of thought. Bina is the elaboration of that thought. We didn't speak about Das, but it's the bridge between those two faculties and the emotions which ensue. The emotions are different uh, motivators. It's the same, same word, emotion, motivation. Uh, in other words, they push us in a direction, either towards something or away from it. That's why the emotions are on uh, two axes, right and left, which is uh, attraction and repulsion. So all emotions are either a desire to go toward something or, or get away from it. Um, and then malchus, which is expression, either through uh, speech or through action, or, or even internal expression, which is called thought. Thought is a form of expression. Um, so that's... Chachma through Malchus, what, what, what we've just described. In other words, we've described a model that begins with an initial idea. Hmm. Let's make a peanut butter jelly sandwich. And then the elaboration on that idea. Oh, okay. How are we going to do it? And uh, what kind of bread are we going to use? What flavor jelly? And then it goes into emotions about, oh, maybe I don't want to do it because uh, it's a bunch of sugar I don't need. Oh, no, but I do want to do it. So it's, it's, no, it's nostalgic. <laughs> and then the malchus is the, you finally, you make the peanut butter jelly sandwich and you eat it. Don't forget to wash, make a bracha, bench beer because I'm in afterwards. Uh, so that's a whole self-contained process there from Chachma the initial inception, all the way down to Malchus, which is the uh, carrying it out. But there's something behind that process that sort of lurks behind the curtain that um, is the engine of that entire process. In other words, that initial idea didn't come out of nowhere. Relatively speaking, we call it nowhere. We say chokhmah ma'ayin timatzi, the chokhmah comes out of nowhere, but it's not really nowhere. We call it nowhere, meaning subjectively, we don't relate to it well, so it's as if it were from nowhere. But really, what is the nowhere from whence the initial idea emerges? It is called rotzain. Will. And will is supra rational. It doesn't have an intelligent reason. It's just a desire. It's a drive, a proclivity. I want it because I want it. It gives rise to the idea in Chachma. <laughs> then through Bina and Das, I'll come up with reasons either legitimate or otherwise, explanations, rationalizations, um, 
Or, you know, I don't want to cheapen it and make it sound like uh, <coughs> the idea was was not a legitimate or valid idea. Let's say in a in a in 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 a in a context where where the idea I came up with was a positive thing. So I may have a sudden idea. Oh, I'd very much like to uh, go give charity to the poor. Okay, so that's a great idea. Um, but I don't really know why. I can't really articulate it yet. So the articulation, the giving it a reason, the explanation comes after. Comes after. But <clears throat> what came before is the desire, the drive to do it, the rutzing. <coughs> so Malchus is rooted in Kesser, Kesser Malchus, the crown of kingship. In other words, the final product that Malchus delivers and the initial desire to have that thing are in some ways one and the same. You've come full circle. The actual performance of the will and the will itself are almost like just two dimensions of one of one entity. And there's a very simple way. To, I know these ideas sound extremely abstruse, but there's a very simple way of, of wrapping our heads around that concept. And that is that if you have a will or a desire, the will will not be satisfied by conceptualizing it or having strong emotions about it. Uh, it will only be satisfied by having it done, having it completed. To the contrary, the more you intellectualize and emotionalize about a desire without actually following through practically, uh, the more unfulfilled you feel, not, not less unfulfilled, more unfulfilled. So you see there how will and actual uh, deed are sort of one and the same. And that's why if you don't do someone's desire, you haven't done it at all. You haven't done anything for them at all. Think about it in the divine covenant. If God tells you his will, and that's what Torah is, God's will, which is why, by the way, there are 613 biblical commandments and seven rabbinical commandments, which is 620, which is the numerical value of keser. Again, keser being the crown, the will. So when Hashem expresses his will as the 620 commandments, rabbinical and biblical. And that's why also there are 620 letters on the tablets that Moses uh, carved. Ten commandments are composed of 620 letters for that same reason. So when God expresses his will, the only way to really satisfy that will is in actual deed, not by meditating on it, but only by doing it, physically performing the mitzvah. So you see here how the end of the process and the, not even the beginning of the process, but that which begins before the beginning of the process are, are, are really one and the same. They're really one and the same. And for that reason, we say like this. Ezu Isha Kshero. Who is a proper woman? Kshera is from the word kosher, fitting, proper. Who is a proper woman? Baila. The one who does the will of her husband. <sighs> Sounds pretty sexist. Sounds like uh, we're saying that a woman only has value when she does what her husband tells her to do. Okay. If that idea strikes you that way, I'm going to ask you to automatically assume that you're misunderstanding it. If it rubs you the wrong way, then you're misunderstanding it. 
Okay, great. How am I misunderstanding it? I'm glad you asked. Okay. <sighs> you got to look at the whole concept. The word in Hebrew, in the holy tongue, the verb la'asois, la'asot, can mean both to do as well as to make. It means to do and to make. So, Ezu Ishak Sheira, who is a proper woman, Haisa Ritzin Baila, who does the will of her husband, who makes the will of her husband. She is not just Malchus, she is Kesser Malchus. She's not just the one who gets it done. She's the one who triggers the desire to begin with that that should be the idea that's getting implemented and getting done. She creates within him a will. So we make all types of jokes, sometimes misogynistic jokes, about husbands asking wives, tell me what I think, honey. But that's a cynical way of representing something that's an unavoidable existential truth. Because the truth is that a proper woman does implant within her husband the desire which gives rise to the idea which then gives rise to the emotions, which then finally give rise to the performance and the follow-through in actual deed. Femininity has a special power to elicit a will, a desire. So remember our dilemma that we were discussing, the unique dilemma of femininity. Seemingly, she's trapped. She can't make the first move. And if she does, we called it proverbial Shabbos desecration, if you recall. She can't impregnate herself. Excuse the very vivid but quite accurate imagery. So what is she supposed to do if she can't make the first move? She has to realize there's a move before the first move. <laughs> there's a move before number one. And that is the power of femininity. It is to create a will within the masculine so that he can initiate, she can receive, cultivate, develop, perfect, and give back, and both be fulfilled. But in order to do this, she needs to understand that she is working with tiny little instruments. She's working with a watchmaker's tools, not with a uh, lumberjack's whipsaw. Because sometimes to, to elicit a will, a new desire, requires working with absolutely microscopic, nanoscopic scales of otherwise undetectable emotional energy. I hope I don't sound like I'm, I'm satirizing this entire idea because I mean this in complete earnestness. You have to be ready to... Work with tiny, tiny amounts, <laughs> trace amounts of raw materials. You can't make something from nothing. That's right. We said that he's got to provide raw materials. You can't make something from nothing. 
but we can have a very liberal definition of something. That's why much of the art of femininity is identifying even the most subtle amount of energy, labeling it, reinforcing it, giving attention to it, feeding it, and causing it to become uh, more amplified. Um, and again, I said that femininity and masculinity doesn't strictly mean male and female. All of us act in a feminine way in this sense. Whenever we, um, whenever we choose to be grateful, you know, you can wait until the situation is exactly as you've envisioned it and reserve the right to be thankful only then. You can, you can choose to do that. Um, but what we understand about the spiritual mechanics of the universe is that type of deferred uh, gratitude actually causes a... Uh, causes the flow of energy to dry up and in in contrast when we express gratitude even for the little amount that we're getting it causes the pipeline to open and the blessings to flow so that's why quite often the most powerful prayer isn't please it's thank you I love this. It will be sure swell to have more of this. More of this. Even if it's a tiny amount that you have. Women um, are in a, in a position to expand upon energies that their husbands would otherwise allow to lie dormant or, or barely expressed. And the art of femininity is to take notice of these microscopic movements and to encourage them and certainly not to reject positive motion, even if it's, even if it's, tiny and 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 that's for the reason i i was mentioning about the lack of gratitude causing the flow to to subside or to even to to cease the worst thing that can happen for a for a masculine um giver is to have what he's giving refused so a man comes up with a silly idea um, let's go to Yellowstone National Park for this coming school vacation. Okay. Now, you know that it's completely impractical. He's not taking into account a lot of different things that if you would think about the situation of this family right now and, and, and your needs and, and what the kids need and like... It's, 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 not a, it's not a good idea. It's not a practical idea, okay? But remember, <laughs> you know, like we're talking about Chochmah being masculine. It's just brainstorming. And if you shut down brainstorming, it's very easy to shut down brainstorming. It's very easy to make people self-conscious when you're brainstorming and say, well, that's a dumb idea, okay? So I won't talk anymore. It's very easy to, to shut down creativity, Okay. So in a, in a case like this, and I'm using this as a metaphor, but also as a practical example, he comes up with some kooky idea like, let's go to Yellowstone on the kids' school break. Now, you know, practically speaking, it doesn't suit you. It's not really appropriate for the needs of this family right now. But the art of femininity in this case would be to receive that idea and to turn it into something that actually is appropriate for this family. So you could stop it and you could shut it down. And you know what happens to a mashpia who put himself out there 
And it's very vulnerable for Amish Bia to put, him up, put himself out there because that's all he is. All he is is what he can produce. And you throw back in his face what he produced. Okay, now I feel shame, self-consciousness. That's it. And then you, the, the wife, wonder where has he gone? Well, he checked out because he doesn't want to be vulnerable anymore to have whatever he's offering shut down or rejected. So the art is, okay, we got momentum. Well, he's thinking about taking a trip. Well, it's a totally wrong destination, but let's work with this. <laughs> we can work with this, okay? It's a little, it's, it's, we got some momentum going here. So we'll turn Yellowstone into uh, the Poconos. Whatever it is we have to do, but work with it, receive it, develop it. That's the beauty of it. See, when the genetic material is deposited within the womb, it has the potential to be articulated in, in, in many different ways. But depending on how she unpacks it, that's how it's going to actually come, come into being. And, and, and by the way, I'll tell you even more. I'll tell you how, how in, in incredibly powerful that feminine capacity is. Not only could she take the Yellowstone suggestion and turn it into the Poconos if she needs to, she could take the Yellowstone suggestion and turn it into staying home. We, we're going to stay home and make a tent in the backyard, and she's going to say, thank you, Tati. This was all your idea. And he's going to beam with pride. Yes, it was. And I'm not joking. How many breakdowns in, in, in trust and in goodwill occur when the feminine partner in the marital union shuts down something that the masculine partner has offered? And she doesn't even understand how devastating it is for him. So what I'm suggesting is that instead... Work with what you've got. Develop it. Expand upon it. Really, if you're good at being feminine, you could turn it into anything you need to turn it into. Now, having said that, I want to make a major disclaimer. And I've probably lost some people who were disturbed that I haven't said this clearly yet. And if I've lost you already, I don't know if you're going to know that I ever said this. If I'm about to lose you, please don't go away because I am going to address this question of, well, hold on a second. Are you suggesting that basically women got to take whatever they can get and they can't really choose what to receive? And my answer is no, God forbid, I am not saying that. I would never suggest that anyone, a man or a woman, should volunteer to be mistreated or disrespected. If you feel that you are being treated in a way that compromises your safety, certainly, or even more so, your human dignity then you do not have to and should not be available to receive that. Because in addition to the very clear moral implications, there's a, there's a practical side of this as well. And that is, in any case, femininity, a true Macabre is not going to be able to do her thing when she's not feeling relaxed and safe. You see, I spoke about earlier that when a mashpia gives, it's a, it's, it's a supreme act of vulnerability. And it is, and that's why if he has his, what he's offering, he has it shut down, he will, he'll shut down. And you know, no one can sulk quite like a man. They say, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Is that Shakespeare? Could be. But nobody can sulk like a man scorned. Um, and and, and the, 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 that's 
there's obvious reasons for that. You know, when, when you're a giver and you're an initiator and you have what to give, but nobody wants to take it. So what do you, where are you supposed to go with that? So pity party, that's what happens. You go sulk. So I mentioned that when a man gives and what he's giving is shut down, that's a, he's being very vulnerable and that it's very painful when he's rejected in that state of vulnerability. But, at the same time, I want to say explicitly that there's such a thing as feminine vulnerability as well. And this is not a vulnerability contest. We're not seeing whose vulnerability is greater. But uh, there are certainly different types of vulnerability. And in one respect, at least, the vulnerability of receiving... Um, is riskier than the vulnerability of giving. The, the risk that a giver stands to, uh, the, the, the risk that a giver is running by giving um, is that he'll end up being embarrassed. He'll get shot down. But the risk that a recipient has when she opens her, herself up to receive, if God forbid things turn south, she stands to be destroyed. The violation and the encroachment of being given to in unwanted, unwelcomed, unsafe ways is devastating. And many times, once that line is crossed, it becomes almost impossible. I don't want to dash anybody's hopes and call it impossible, but it becomes incredibly difficult to ever restore the feeling of security that femininity needs to exist within in order to function properly. So I said earlier that women should not just accept any old emotional energy that their husbands present or any old idea that their husbands present. If it's toxic, disrespectful, invasive, um, it should be shut down. And, and, and this is what I'm saying. First of all, because you have a moral obligation to respect yourself. But secondly, just from a practical standpoint, when too much of this happens, eventually the recipient builds up walls and those walls can become almost impossible to to ever enter it's almost impossible to, to put a door a doorway into those walls once they're put up um that's why very often you see that that women who grew up with some type of traumatic disrespect of their boundaries especially in the form of a betrayal by uh by a by a by a primary caretaker um they build up walls which become incredibly uh detrimental to marital intimacy and i don't just mean that in the in the physical sense although that too um so it's incredibly important that femininity is safe because it's inherent in her role as a recipient that in order to receive, I have to feel that whatever it is I'm taking in is not going to hurt me. At the very least, it's not, it's not going to hurt me. And, and ideally, it's, it's, going to, it's going to help me. It's going to n nourish me. And I, I just want to clarify because I don't I, I don't want to sound bleak when I say this. I don't want anyone here listening to me to say, well, I've been violated in my past or I've been violated in my present relationship with unwanted uh, emotional energy and therefore that's it. The wall is up and it will never come down. I don't want, God forbid, anyone to come to that conclusion. What I think would be more helpful is to recognize that if you're feeling disconnected, um, there's a reason for it. And it has to do with safety. 
And once you understand the problem, you can pursue a solution. And that is that when you're able to have the proper boundaries that will make you feel safe, then slowly you will be, begin to soften those, those boundaries which are too rigid. You will begin to ease up off of your hypervigilance and you will be able to receive emotional energy from the masculine figure in your life. And uh, if you need extra help with that, that's an incredibly important thing to do for you, for your home, for your children, for your children's marriages. It's very, very, very important. Now, I want to just talk about one other concept. You know, we've been going on for a while now. Um, and by the way, I do appreciate the comments in the chat, which I am glancing at. Um, I do appreciate them. Um, I haven't been reading them out loud, but I do see them. Um, I want to just mention one other thing, and that is one other aspect of the masculine-feminine dynamic. Um, we described it as mashpia and makabal, which we first defined as giver and recipient, but then later we redefined as first giver and bigger giver. You see, they're both givers and they're both exceptional givers. They're just exceptional in different ways. He's the first giver and she's the biggest giver. How you like that? Okay. So there's another way of describing these categories. And the Rebbe speaks about this in chapter five of the Mimer. Um, The Rebbe is in chapter 5 describing the superiority of the feminine and her higher source that we mentioned. And the way that he brings that idea out is by saying that if you look at Zoh and Malchus, Zoh is delivering the emotional energies, which are the building blocks of creation. And, and, and Malchus is just sort of receiving that and, and, and they develop within her, and then they're born from her. So, like, her role is almost kind of automatic, almost, almost passive. And his, ro his role is much more active. And at first glance, that can, that can appear to indicate some type of superiority in him. He's the doer, and she's just sort of along for the ride. Um, but that ever brings out something that... It's a very deep concept, and that is that masculine and feminine, or Zaw and Malchus in this case, uh, to be specific, is not um, doer and passive participant. That's not the right way to categorize it. It's doer and beer. I don't even think beer... I'm not talking about beer like Yachacho Piva. I'm talking about a beer. There's a doer and there's a beer. There's doing and there's being. So we know what a doer is. Or like we say in Yiddish, a macher. Get stuff done. Yeah, but there's also a beer, someone who knows how to be. And it is far deeper to be something than to do something. Shabbos is about being as opposed to doing. The six work days are about doing as opposed to being. Doing is performative and to a degree inherently superficial. 
But being is something that is of the essence. It goes to the core. This is what I am. I am being, not just doing. Six days a week, we go out and we do. On the seventh day of rest, we be. And if we didn't have a day to just be, there would be no purpose to go out for another week and to do. We need to reconnect with being in order to have a reason to go back to doing. Masculinity needs to check back in with femininity to have a reason for everything he does. Because I can go out and I can make a living and I can bring home a paycheck. And if it's just a bachelor pad, then what's the purpose of it all? To distract myself while I meet my biological needs, have enough recreation to forget about the fact that I work to eat to eat to work, lather, rinse, repeat. Without a home, without something infinite going on, meaning the manifestation of infinite potential through bringing generations into being, then there's no purpose to any of my doing. So what the feminine is giving to the masculine, again, she's a bigger giver, is so essential Now, this, this distinction manifests itself in various ways. But I just want to address a mundane example. And, and it may sound silly, but I think it's something that's relatable. And perhaps addressing it now in, in, in light of this distinction of being and doing, we might understand this better. A woman speaks to her husband to connect. You know, in the holy tongue, there are different words for speech. Dibur, Amira, and Sikha. So Dibur is a command, an imperative statement. The Asera said Dibrois. The Ten Commandments are called Dibrois. So Dibur, Yedabar Hashem El Meisha, is a command. Amira is informational. It's to convey information. And Sicha is not to convey a command or information, but rather for the purpose of bonding. It's not practical. It is about a relationship. It deepens bonds. Very often, a woman will engage in this type of speech known as sicha. And this is what our sages tell us women are prolific in. They have a lot of sicha, uses specifically that term. And we make misogynistic jokes about women are always talking that's not what it means. It's not talking about how many words they use. It's talking about the kinds of words they use and the reason they use words. I'm not saying women talk more, although there is that old joke about the woman uh, sitting in her kitchen getting ready to leave the house and her husband's reading the paper and he says, look at this article I just read. It says that women say 5,000 words a day and uh, men 
only say 2,500 words a day. So women say twice as many words a day as men. And the wife says to the husband, that's because women have to repeat themselves when their husbands don't hear them the first time. And the husband looks up from the paper and says, what did you just say? Okay. But at any rate, it doesn't mean that women say more words. It means that in general, and of course we're painting with a broad brush, obviously when we speak about these categories, these are, these are generalizations and simplifications. We don't mean every woman and every man. But we mean that women use words for different reasons than men very often. So sometimes a woman will, will come home, she'll tell her husband about something that happened to her that day, and the man's like, well, what do you want me to do about it? Well, nothing. It's not Debor. Or, well, why are you telling me this? What am I supposed to know? Nothing. It's not Amira. I'm sharing my life with you so that we can have a shared experience and be bonded. Well, that's a weird thing to do. If you need me to do something, tell me. If you need me to know something, tell me. But you don't need me to do anything. You don't, me to know, you don't need me to know anything. You just want me to be there for you? That's weird. So you do have to understand that from a masculine perspective, men know how to do there for you. They don't know how to be there for you. And it's frustrating and confusing as a man to be asked to be. And depending on the man, it's really confusing. <sighs> you know, depending on the man, the, the, the whole idea of bonding that's not practical, that's not like results driven or agenda driven is, is confusing. You know, that's why a lot of times you'll see a group of women sitting around and chatting, even if they don't know each other well, and a group of men who, who've known each other all their lives and they have nothing to say to each other. Because I'm not going to sit here and make small talk. What's the purpose of that? In fact, not only I won't make small talk, but I'm not even going to talk to you about deep, important things that are, that are heavy on your heart because that's just, we don't do that. Unless you went, hey, look, I, I'm your bro. You need me to do something for me. Tell me. I'll do it for you. I'm there for you. I'll give you the shirt off my back. But you just want to talk to me? <laughs> What's the point of that? So here's what I want women to, to understand. Two things about this. One is it's hard for men. Two is it is so incredibly necessary for men. It's hard for men because we are doers, not beers, and it's hard for us to relate to just being. But it's so incredibly necessary because you can't just keep doing and doing and doing and doing and never check back in with your being. You can't be working like the six work days over and over and over and over again without a Shabbos. It is absolutely soul crushing. So as much as we resist it, as much as we are bad at it and it feels awkward for us to engage in it, we need to come back to this state of cessation of doing and revisiting our own femininity in the form of our other half, our better half, who can allow us to just be through bonding without an agenda not based on any task. When we don't have that, we go insane. So, yeah, this is, this is tough, putting a lot of onus on the women, basically telling you <laughs> that your, your husband's uh, well-being depends on you coaxing him into an activity. Well, it's not even an activity. It's a non-activity. It's not a doing. It's a being. That his well-being depends on you coaxing him into a state that he's reluctant to enter into. But that's what it is. That's what it is. And... 
Let me just describe this a, a little bit more. Um, you know Aaron's two sons who died? Remember Aaron Akain, Moshe's brother? He had four sons. Two of them died. They were very spiritual boys. That's why they died. They entered the Holy of Holies and they became subsumed in, in, in their, their spiritual bliss, rapture. Um, so the, the sages give many different explanations for why that happened. And, and of course, the, the mystical explanation, as I, is, as I just said, that they became attracted to, to spirituality and they didn't want to return to their bodies. But there are other explanations that are given, like they weren't wearing their full priestly uniform. Um, another explanation is that they were drunk. Another explanation was that they were unmarried. They were bachelors. And Chassidus explains that really these are all saying the same thing. All of these explanations are saying the same thing. In other words, they were spiritually sensitive. They weren't wearing their priestly uniform. They were drunk and they were single. It's all saying the same thing. You know what it all is? One common denominator. They were ungrounded, untethered. They lacked an anchor. And that's why they left their bodies and didn't come back to them. See, the fact that they weren't wearing their priestly garments, that's, what do I need? I've got to wear a uniform. I'm spiritual, not religious. It's okay. I don't have to wear the, I don't have to wear the getup. Also, uh, metaphorically, garments in Tanya, in chapter 4 of Tanya, garments are, are, are mitzvahs. When you do a mitzvah, it's called putting on a garment. So they were those, like these spiritual people. No, meditate on tefillin. I don't have to put on tefillin. I don't have to do it. I, I just have to think about it. So they weren't into the physical stuff, which is why they were drunk. They wanted escapism. They wanted to numb themselves out from experiencing what their physical senses would otherwise experience. And that's why they weren't married. That's why they weren't married. Because what is marriage for a man? It's being grounded. It's being forced to live in the here and now. It's being forced to come down to earth. <sighs> the misogynistic way of saying it is the old ball and chain. Okay. Is she a ball and chain or is she your anchor? Does she keep you tethered to the world where your soul has to do its mission? Because without his feminine component, meaning his wife, a man will become untethered. And he will take flight. Peter Pan syndrome, Neverland. And if he doesn't understand that Hashem only created us for a dirabatachtainim, that Hashem only created in order to have this physical earth become holier than heaven, so a man could become very resentful of that force that's pulling him down to the physical world. Why are you pulling me down? Either if I'm a real spiritual guy, let me go meditate all day. Or if I'm not so spiritual, I have other ways of tuning out. Self-medicating, distracting, numbing, escaping, escaping. But the feminine role is to be the reality check and to pull him down from there and to say, come home. That's why a high priest on Yom Kippur, on the holiest day of the year, when he would enter the holiest place in the world, the Holy of Holies, he could not enter unless he was married. Now, there are technical ex explanations for why or how we know that. It's because he says a confessional prayer and he mentions that he's asking for atonement for himself and his home, and his home refers to his wife. 
That's the technical explanation, but that's not a contradiction. It only enhances the deeper explanation. His wife is his home. Literally, she is a housing. She is a container that pulls him into the world where his soul needs to be to do its mission. And if he doesn't have that, he can't enter the Holy of Holies on the holiest day of the year because to do so will just cause him to fly off, beam me up, Scotty, and he ain't coming back. So when a woman tells her husband, I need you to stay home and play with the kids, she's saving his life. She's not saying it because she's a wimp and she can't manage and she needs him to come take the pressure off of her. I mean, maybe that's also true, but that's not really the point. Not that she's a wimp, God forbid, but maybe practically also she needs some help. But it's much deeper than that. When she says, I need you to come home and, 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 and have supper with the kids, it's because his tendency is to escape the here and now, the mundane, the pedestrian She is the force that brings him back into it. We said that he comes from Zoh and she comes from Malchus. Those are the spherotic terms for it. There's also Shemois, divine names that correspond to those paradigms. Kud Shabrichu Shchinte. Zoh, the six emotional energies, is called Kud Shabrichu. That's an Aramaic phrase. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be He. Kaddish doesn't just mean holy, though. Kaddish means Kaddish Muvdal, separate, aloof. In fact, that is what holiness means in, in, in Jewish mystical thought. Something's holy because it's designated and separate and set aside. That's why, by the way, marriage is called Kiddushin, because it separates a, an, an, an exclusive relationship. So, Kud Shabrichu means the aspect of divinity, which is aloof. He's up in the heavens. He's not really interested in, in the physical plane. Shechinte means his Shechina. What's Shechina? Shechina is from the word Shechenes, indwelling. She dwells within. The Shechina is Hashem's femininity, which dwells within creation. So Kud Shabrichu is Hashem's masculinity, which is aloof from creation. Shechina is Hashem's femininity, which dwells within creation. And not only does Shechina dwell within creation, but Afilu Baseich Tumasam, the Shechina follows the Jews even when they're in a spiritually impaired state, even when, they are in, when they're defiled and impure. Because femininity gets down and dirty. In the nitty gritty, like a mommy changing the soiled diapers. Masculinity wants to go up. Femininity is grounded. They're two opposite extremes. That's why Chosin and Kala, in order for them to meet in the middle, Chosin, groom, is Nechus Darga, let's go down. Because he has to come down to her. Kala, bride, is klois hanefesh, expiration of the soul. Because she goes up. She goes up. He comes down. Somehow they manage to meet. She is his container and his anchor. To keep his soul in a body. And in the world where his shlichus, where his divinely appointed mission can only be the only place where his divinely appointed mission can be carried out. I'll say more about that. And that is, I suspect that certain patriarchal influences 
are so ubiquitous that even when I'm describing this right now, there's a certain assumption, even though I've explicitly said that the feminine role has a unique superiority, both are essential, masculine and feminine are both essential, but even though I've said that the feminine role has a unique dimension, and a unique in some respects is superior, you may be hearing this and you're still thinking in terms of, well, at the end of the day, you're calling him spiritual, you're calling her material. Come on. I mean, that's just code words for he's noble and she's crass. He's a, he's a prince and she's a little uh, Cinderella. And he's uh, coming down. He lowers himself to come down. To, I mean, you know, you're dressing it up. You're making it sound nice. You're dressing it in euphemism. But uh, at the end of the day, what you're basically saying is she's dragging him down. And she's, uh, she's into material things. And she just wants his credit card. And that's it. And he wants to think about philosophy. And she wants to spend his money. I, I know it. It's the same old misogynistic tropes. I know what you're really saying. You just fancying it up okay so good all right i'm glad you called me out great all right so let me respond to that if you're thinking that or if now that i said it you're you're now thinking it <laughs> where do you get the assumption that the physical and material plane is somehow any less intrinsically valuable than the spiritual plane where does that come from? Why do we believe that? Because it's absolutely not true. Um, God created the physical world because this is where he wants to be at home. He wants a dira betachtoinim. He doesn't want to reside in the heavens. He wants the physical world to become perfected so that it is holier than the heavens. And he took our pristine souls, which resided in the heavens, and plunged them down into physical bodies so that we could accomplish this, this task. And that the ultimate perfection of all, which we refer to as the Messianic era, will be this state where the physical world is so pristine, where the physical world is so refined that even souls in the highest levels of paradise, souls that Moshe Rabbeinu, who passed away 3,300 however many years ago, and every single year on his yard site, he's going up another level. He's up 3,300 some odd levels in paradise, but when this physical world will be refined and perfected, the only way for his soul to continue going up will be to take a U-turn and come back into a body in the resurrection. Because the physical world will be higher than the highest heaven. That's the ultimate paradox, that the infinite one wants to be expressed within the finite. So really, the idea of valuing femininity as a, as a grounding force is not secondary. It's not, uh, it's not ancillary. It's actually the essence of everything. Or, to state it in terms that we've already used recently, it is being as opposed to doing. Being as opposed to doing. Souls in heaven do. They, they make aliyahs. They, they do uh, elevations. They're moving. Yelchum mechayel el choyel. But a soul in a body is able to be. In other words, there's mamali and there's seyvev, the filling light and the encompassing light. So in heaven, they experience the filling light. They have a pyrotechnic show. It's giluyim, revelations of godliness. That's God as a doer. But in the physical world, where we can actually surrender ourselves to godliness and become an extension of his will by doing his mitzvah, we are able to be with God. Not just to be an observer. In heaven, a soul is a subjective observer of godliness. On earth, the soul in a body 
ironically enough, with the buffer and impediment of the body, enables the soul to finally be with God, to be an extension of godliness, to have an objective experience as opposed to a subjective one, merely a subjective one. So the role of femininity here is uh, not just important to understand the context of marriage. It's important to understand the context of the reason for all of existence, the point of it all. And uh, what did we say? That ultimately... Femininity is a recipient who's really a bigger giver <laughs> than the initial giver. <sighs> what happens through the embodiment of the Jewish souls down here in the physical world? The Jewish people are described as Hashem's wife. That's the entire running metaphor of the Song of Songs of King Solomon. And as his wife, we give him a home. We draw him down here where he will feel at home. And we end up giving to him, Kaviachal, something greater than what he gave to us. <laughs> Now, we're nothing without him. He's everything. He gave us everything. He gave us our existence. He gave us the Torah so we could navigate our existence. He created the world, and he gave us the form with, within which to, to follow the, 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 the rules of the Torah. He's giving everything, and yet we take that, and we give it back to him, as a true wife does with a husband. We give it back to him. And that's what it means to truly be a, a bride. The art of receiving and returning what you've received in a, in a condition better and more meaningful than how it was given to you at first. That's what we do. We come down to the physical world and we give it meaning by doing our mitzvahs faithfully, even with all the difficulties of embodiment. As in the microcosm, so in the macrocosm, and vice versa. In order to make this world a home for God and his bride, the Jewish people, we need each Jewish home to be a representation of this unity of Yichud Kut Shabrichu Shrinte, the unification of the Holy One and His indwelling force, the energy which is loftier than the physical, and the energy which reveals how the physical has a greater sanctity even than the spiritual realms. We have to unite those two. You know, we're, we're coming up to the, the weekly readings, Torah readings, about Joseph and being a slave in Egypt, and then eventually he becomes reunited with his family. And uh, there's a, an episode where toward the end of Jacob's life, 
he's on his deathbed and he, he asks Joseph, who's the viceroy of Egypt, to promise that he will only bury Jacob in the Maras HaMachpelah in Hevrein, the, the cave of Machpelah in uh, the holy city of, of Hebron. And uh, there's a whole discussion that they have, which is recorded in the oral tradition. But the gist of the conversation essentially is that Jacob says to Joseph, this is incredibly important that you bear me in this holy site. And although I did not do this for your mother, Rachel, rather I buried her along the way, essentially where she passed away, that's basically where I buried her. Um, and I did not bring her to the holy site, um, but I'm asking you to do this for me. And is, this begs the question, why didn't Jacob do for his wife, his beloved wife, who he worked seven years for in order to, to have her hand in marriage? Why didn't he bury her there? And there's much to be said about this, but I just want to share with you one thought. This is the difference between doing and being. This is the difference between spirituality and the holiness of the material. <laughs> Jacob is our patriarch. Patriarchs are masculine. He needs to be buried in a holy site. Just like a man needs to go to shul and he needs to daven. And if he doesn't do these things, he doesn't feel Jewish. Because his Judaism is about doing. But a woman's Judaism is much more essential. It's not about the revelations that come about when you do. It's about, as opposed to revelation, it's about essence. Revelation is in flux. Sometimes it's more revealed, sometimes it's less. Essence, by definition, is a constant. It is what it is, what it is. So therefore, wherever she is buried becomes holy. <laughs> Jacob has to be brought to a place that's holy. Rachel is buried, and the place is revealed as having been holy. A man has to go do things that already have a, a, a value assigned to them as being holy. Go to, go to, go to shul and daven in a minion and, and go to a Torah class. And he puts on his, 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 whole, his gear, his talus, and his tefillin. But a woman's spirituality is more essential she can be doing things that are seemingly mundane and and have nothing to do with spirituality. Packing lunches and, and sorting clothes and <sighs> lining up backpacks on the, the pegs by the front closet. None of this sounds overtly spiritual or, or, or religious. And yet, this is the essence of spirituality. This is where God wants to be. God wants to be in the home, in the physical trappings of the home, in all of its mundane glory. And this is what femininity provides for masculinity in the same manner as we provide this for God himself. Wrap your mind around that. We sanctify the physical world. We reveal the underlying sanctity hidden within the physical world so that God, the Holy One, can come down here and be at home. That is a feminine role. And in that sense... Everything that we do as Jews is homemaking. Everything we do as Jews, whether we're male Jews or female Jews, is, is, is feminine, is, 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 is a wife's duty to 
her divine husband to Hashem. And lest you think, again, that we are relegating us to a, or, re, or rather we're relegating femininity to, to secondary status because, oh, the male corresponds to God and the female corresponds to God's people. So clearly you're assigning higher value to the, the masculine paradigm than the fe feminine paradigm. Stop thinking that way. <laughs> That's not correct. God wants to be down here. I know it's very hard for us to think that way. But the fact that we, ult that, that we automatically assign greater value to creator than, crea than creation is, 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 a, is a mistake. Or just for clarification, let me ask you a question. Is God creator or creation? Neither. He can't be defined or locked in either box. Both creator and creation are expressions of his infinite essence. Just like, is a person a male or a female? Neither. A person is a male and a female together. Um, on this very auspicious day of the Rebbe and the Rebbetson's wedding anniversary, may we all receive extra blessings to devote ourselves with sensitivity and care to our marriage with God and our marriage with our spouses where each one informs the other and the other informs the one and may we very speedily see the complete revelation and culmination of the courtship the the marriage that, that, that was begun at Mount Sinai which was the betrothal May we see the, the wedding party, the great, great wedding party that will be with the coming of Mashiach.